Thank you, Baxter and John, for the beautiful music that reminds us, Kumbaya, come together. Today is a very special day in the life of First Baptist Church and the life of Christians around the world and that we remember together that this meal of remembrance that we Christians take, we do so around the world. In different cultures and languages and situations, we remember together. And today we remember as part of worship that we do that with everyone who claims Christ as Lord around the globe. I encourage you to take a look at your bulletin cover today for some beautiful imagery of what a family of faith gathered around a table might look like. And we are grateful to Jan Richardson for her gift of art today. I do have a few announcements for us today. First, I am grateful to Mary Taylor and our flower and communion committees for their hard work on the Lord's table today. The Lord's table has tangible signs of the world's similarities and yet differences through the various types of bread that are on the table. Each type of bread is something from around the world. And so we hope that this bread and the homemade bread that we will serve for communion will remind us of our interconnectedness and yet the beauty of difference together today. Also, coming up this coming weekend, we have a couple of exciting days. First, on Saturday, this Saturday, October 7th, will be Uptown's Oktoberfest. And First Baptist will have a booth there, and we need your help to come and work that booth. We need setup help, working a couple hour shifts, and then takedown help. This is an opportunity for all of us to share the ministries of our church with our community. A lot of people come out to Oktoberfest, so it's an exciting time to share. Uh, those of you who worked it last year may remember it was moved to December. It was much colder then. Uh, it looks to be a beautiful day on a Saturday. So I hope you can come out and help us with the setup, with working the booth, and with takedown. If you are able to sign up, go ahead and call or email the church office, and we will put your name down. Um, during that two-hour shift, I will let you know, we will also be handing out balloons to our children and doing crafts with them. So especially if you have a, a joy for children, we'd love to have you there. Then on Sunday, next Sunday, October the 8th, we're going to have our regular worship service and Sunday school time. But in the afternoon at 2, we're going to have a special new service a blessing of the animal service. We'll hold this outdoors on the front lawn, and if we have rain, we may move under something, but we invite you to bring your pets as we bless them, as we honor God's creation, and remember just what a gift these animals and creation is in our lives. So I hope you will come out for that next Sunday afternoon at two. Friends, it is a good season to be in ministry and mission together. There are other opportunities you'll see in your bulletin from picking up the play pails, we can finally take those home and fill them up, to donating to our local elementary school. There are so many things we can do to serve our neighbors who are in need. So I hope you will take time to do that. Now let us call us ourselves into God's presence. We'll do this with a responsive call to worship, which you can find in your bulletin. <coughs> Today, we are invited to a joyful feast hosted by Jesus Christ. All who are hungry will find bread and life here. From down the street to across town, from single households to apartment dwellers to those without shelter. All who are thirsty will find a fountain of grace, grace here. From every class, every race, every status, from little ones with sippy cups to elders with overflowing hearts. All who are lost will find safety here. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break together and the cup we share together this hour may retell our common stories together and reshape our common bonds together and remember our common grace together and the communion of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one in whose life and death you have torn down all our divisions. And so may we be one with all who share this feast this day, with all your children at every corner of your table around this whole world. May we share this abundant cup with those who thirst for your justice. May we share this abundant bread with those who hunger for your righteousness. May we be united with every corner of your story 
United in hope, united in vision, united in purpose, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us from this table to be the body of Christ in the world. Send us with a spirit of courage from this hour, a spirit of love that we may be witnesses to your unending story, breathing life into dust. And keep us faithful, keep us fruitful and hopeful until we come at last to the one table of your kingdom to feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm with you and your word, Jesus Christ, the one who came for us, who died for us, who rose for us, the one who intercedes for us, the one who first taught us all to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We are united also in giving thanks this morning. I invite you to stand and raise your, as you are able, and raise your voice in singing number 374. Now thank we all our God, number 374. Thank you for sitting, but I'm afraid I must ask you to please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. 
When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say, from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say, of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, Christ. You may be seated. Join me. Good morning. How are y'all this morning? Good. Good? Good. Okay, so we have a very, yeah, I know, we have a beautiful table. Well, what, yeah. what do y'all think today is? What is so Bread special? Day. Bread day. Today's communion day. Today, and it's actually a very special communion day. It's World Communion Day. I like it. It smells good. It does smell good. <laughs> I like the cherries. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I like, I like the, the one that looks like a braid. Oh, the braided bread. Yeah, they're I, all so beautiful. I like the baguette. The baguette? Very good. So do y'all know what communion is? Bread and bread um, yeah. rhymes. It's when we worship God. Bread Communion's bread. when we worship God? Yeah, yeah we take communion and worship. Do y'all know bread what communion is? And bread, same thing. So communion is a special thing that we do uh, usually every month that where we have a little bit of juice and a little bit of bread that we eat and drink to remember that Jesus died on the cross and resurrected. That's like really important, right? So we take communion to remember, yeah. Um, on, on Easter, he, he and got dead. Yeah, on Easter, yeah, we celebrate that he rose from the dead, that's very right. Yes. And guess what? What? Oh, I, I'm gonna turn six and, and it's going to be my ball picks. Oh, that is so What's special. Six, and, and then, and, so, so and then my, my birthday is ball picks and side duck and Pikachu and... Very and, cool, Charlotte. And, so and I'm going to teach y'all a... I'm going to teach y'all a song to remember World Communion. Can y'all help me sing it? So we're going to sing it through twice, twice, church. And so I'll sing it through the first time. Join in if you can, and then join in on the second time, okay? okay. You'll recognize it. And Pastor David, help me come up with these words, okay? Through the bread and the cup, in his hands, through the bread and the cup, in his hands, through the bread and the cup, in his hand, he's got the whole world in his hands. Very cool, let's sing that again. Through the bread and the cup, in his hands, through the bread and the cup, in his hands through the bread and the cup. 
Jesus loves us very much, and we take communion to remember that. Okay, would you pray with me? Yeah. Repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God. Dear God. thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. And help us share, help us share that, love that love with others. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Can you eat the bread? Very good. Not yet. We're not going to eat the bread yet. Okay, let's go to Children's Church. <laughs> no, not yet. Oh. I invite you to stand as you are able and to join as we sing hymn number 772 for the bread which you have broken, number 772. As every Sunday, we present our tithes and offerings and worship. And it's not because we want someone to pat us on the back for being generous, but because we recognize that in worship, we lay down what we once considered ours and recognize that it was always the Lord's. Just as we share in communion today, we share of our resources in community. So let us bless these gifts together in prayer. God, we share one faith. We have one calling. We are of one soul and one mind, have one God and Father, are filled with one spirit, are baptized with one baptism, and eat of one bread, drink of one cup, confess one name, are obedient to one Lord, work for one cause, and share one hope. Together, we come to know the height and the breadth and the depth of the love of Christ. We are built up to the stature of Christ, to the new humanity. We know and bear one another's burdens, fulfilling the law of Christ, that we need one another, and we build up one another, that we suffer with one another for the sake of righteousness. Together we pray, together we give, together we serve you in this world. Bless these gifts that further that good work that we do together this hour, we pray. Amen.
I would just like to say a word of thanks to Martha Hayes for coming and playing flute for us this morning on our anthem and on our, our hymns as well. Today's gospel lesson begins in the midst of a lot of things. This passage that we read, which yes, is verse 23 to 32. Sorry about the misprint. <laughs> this passage, it sets Jesus in the temple at Jerusalem. And it's not just any day, because just one day before, Jesus had ridden into the city on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It's a text we mostly read during Holy Week, right? On Palm Sunday? Jesus had just been welcomed as a Messiah, maybe not the kind they thought, celebrated by crowds for what he might do, rescuing them from oppression from Rome. Jesus then, just a few verses ahead of our passage, heads straight to the temple, the center of Jewish religious life, and overturned the tables of the money changers. He healed the lame. He listened to children cry out, Hosanna to the son of David. And just the morning of the events of our passage today, Jesus had stopped to curse a fig tree 
that ended up withering to prove a point about faith and doubt. So when Jesus enters the temple in our text today, we're only a few days away from his betrayal and crucifixion. The religious authorities there are ready to confront him about all these things that he had been doing. And they ask him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? They desperately seem to want him to lose his footing, to say the wrong thing so that their own authority would no longer be scrutinized. But Jesus, in good rabbi form and in the way he usually answers things, decides to answer them with a question. He says, I'll answer that for you if you'll answer me one first. And he asks, did the baptism of John, the one who came before him, did it come from heaven or was it from human origin? And you wonder, why does Jesus ask about John here? Well, John came first. John the Baptist came to preach about Jesus coming. So in other words, Jesus is saying, what you say about John and his message says a lot about me and my authority. So answer me this. And here is where we kind of, Matthew writes it in. He says, here's the inner thought processing out loud of these religious leaders. They can't say that John's power is from heaven because they'd earn a retort that they should have believed him about this one to come. In other words, Jesus has some heavenly authority. But it also can't be of human origin because the crowds, who they seem to be a little afraid of, believe that John the Baptist was a prophet. These authorities in the moment are presented as kind of spineless. They're eager to get rid of Jesus but also not wanting to alienate the crowds. I mean, these are their people, right? So they take the path of least resistance and they answer Jesus, we don't know. So basically a non-answer. And Jesus said, okay, then I can't tell you by whose authority I'm doing these things. That was my bargain, one question for another. But instead of leaving it there at this, you know, debate stalemate, Jesus, once again, in true rabbi form, as a teacher, takes the time to tell them a story so that they can learn something. And he tells a parable about a man with two sons. The man tells the first son, go and work in the vineyard today. But the first son, I get the feeling, was probably a rebellious teenager. Nope, not gonna. <laughs> not, not wanting to do anything you ask him to do, right? But... That son, who said he wasn't going to do it, ends up going to the field anyway and working. Then the man tells his second son, go work in the vineyard. And the second son, and this is the literal Greek here, says, I am, sir. And it's an idiom, and it basically means your wish is my command. Like, there's no question that a person who says this means to do what they say they're going to do. But this son, who's been so fervent in what he says doesn't follow through and doesn't go work in the field. And Jesus says, which of the two sons did the will of the father? And as expected, the religious leaders say, well, the first one, because, you know, the one who actually did the will of the father, not just the one who gave lip service to the father's requests, but didn't act on it. And Jesus explains that what he means, you know, sometimes he does that with his parables. He'll stop at the end and say, and here's what that means. And so he does this. He says, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in a way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your mind and believe. Sometimes I think that we forget just how countercultural Jesus was. Because Jesus is so ingrained in our culture, it's hard to imagine it. And I think that we tend to vilify these religious leaders, right? But that's just convenient, also a little anti-Semitic. Because Jesus' teachings, and the Bible generally, should read us, not the other way around. We ought to see ourselves in every pair of shoes in the story, including the religious leaders. 
including that son who gave lip service to what the father had asked, but did not do any actual service. I think too often that we Christians, especially in a dominant Christian place, we, we are the ones that are trying to close the circle of the kingdom of God. We're shutting people out of God's banquet, pretending to somehow be better than those who came to sit at Jesus' table. All, we're all just well-to-do sitting at home, ignoring God's invitation to go out and to serve. We are the ones who, like the religious leaders in the story, willfully close our eyes to what God's kingdom could look like, what Jesus came to usher in. But Jesus point blank tells the religious folks, and frankly, friends, that's us in this story. We are the religious folks. You've had so many chances to believe and understand my kingdom. John's been preaching, you've seen my power. You've asked me questions about my power, which admits you've seen I have some. I've said it over and over. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. It's become a mantra. And still, still you cannot see past protecting yourself, your own self-righteousness, long enough to realize that God's kingdom has come and gone right under your noses while you said a lot of good things about faith, but didn't pay attention to Emmanuel, God with us, the one come to preach a kingdom that didn't match your religious comfort levels. And so Jesus says to them, fine then, it'll be the prostitutes and the tax collectors, all these people you look down on, people who have chosen to follow me, to believe God's kingdom is bigger, who will experience God's kingdom before you ever will. Can we imagine those people who have done such horrible things, made such horrible life choices, things we could never get over in our comfortable rel religious life? And friends, that's true for us too, because we're in the majority now. We, we are clutching our pearls and have suffocating neckties, and we worry that these people might be the ones making up the kingdom of God. How dare he say that? How on earth could that be? But isn't that what Jesus was always saying? It'll be the last person you expect. It'll be the least of these who answer that call in ways that those of us who are comfortable in our faith will never fully grasp. We won't have that kind of depth unless we become like these. I want to leave you with a story about just how different God's kingdom is and will be, and perhaps just how differently we ought to approach our own lives of faith now as we usher God's kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. Tony Campolo is a pastor, a Christian author, and a sociologist, and he wrote in his book, The Kingdom of God is a Party, a story about an experience he had one late, late night in Hawaii, and I'd like to share that with you today. He said, up a side street, I found a little place that was still open. I went in and took a seat on one of the stools at the counter and waited to be served. This was one of those sleazy places that deserves the name Greasy Spoon. I didn't even touch the menu. I was afraid that if I opened the thing, something gruesome would crawl out. But it was the only place I could find that was open. The large guy behind the counter came over and asked me, what do you want? I said I wanted a cup of coffee and a donut. So he poured a cup of coffee and wiped his grimy hand on his sponge apron, grabbed a donut off the shelf behind him. I'm a realist. I know that in the back room of that restaurant, donuts are probably dropped on the floor and kicked around. <laughs> But when everything's out there in front where I can see it, I really would have appreciated it if he'd used a pair of tongs or put some wax paper on the donut. As I sat there munching on my donut and sipping coffee at 3.30 in the morning, the door of the diner sung, suddenly swung open. And to my discomfort, in marched eight or nine provocative and boisterous prostitutes. 
It was a small place, and they sat on either side of me. Their talk was loud and crude. It felt completely out of place and was just about to make my getaway when I overheard the woman beside me say, tomorrow's my birthday. I'm going to be 39. Her friend, supposed friend, responded in a nasty tone. So what do you want from me? A birthday party? What do you want? You want me to get you a cake and sing happy birthday? Come on, said the woman sitting next to me. Why do you have to be so mean? I was just telling you, that's all. Why do you got to put me down? I was just telling you it was my birthday. I don't want anything from you. I mean, why should anyone give me a birthday party? I've never had a birthday party in my whole life. Why should I have one now? When I heard that, I made a decision. I sat and waited until the women had left. Then I called over to the large man behind the counter, and I asked him, do they come in here every night? Yeah, he answered. The one right next to me, does she come in here every night? Yeah, he said, that's Agnes. She comes here every night. Why do you want to know? Because I heard her say that tomorrow is her birthday, I told him. What do you say you and I do something about that? What do you think about us throwing a birthday party for her right here tomorrow night? A cute smile slowly crossed his cheeks, and he answered with a measured delight, well, that's great. I like it. It's a great idea. And he called his wife, who did the cooking in the back room, and he shouted, hey, come here. This guy's got a great idea. Tomorrow's Agnes's birthday. This guy wants to go in with him and throw a birthday party for her right here, tomorrow night. And his wife came out of the back room, bright and smiley. And she said, that's wonderful. You know, Agnes is one of those people. She's just really nice and kind. Nobody does anything nice and kind for her, though. Look, I told them, if it's okay with you, I'll get back here tomorrow morning about 2.30, and I'll decorate the place. I'll even bring a birthday cake. No way, said Harry. That was the guy's name. Birthday cake's my thing. I'll make the cake. So at 2.30 in the morning, I was back at the diner. I had picked up some crepe paper, decorations. I'd made a sign out of big pieces of cardboard that read, Happy Birthday, Agnes. I decorated the diner from one end to the other. I had that diner looking good. The woman who did the cooking must have gotten word out on the street because by 3.15, every prostitute in Honolulu was in the place. It was wall-to-wall -wall prostitutes and me. At 3.30 on the dot, the door of the diner swung open, and in came Agnes and her friend. I had everybody ready. I mean, I was the MC of the, of the affair. And when they, all, when they came in, we all screamed, Happy birthday! Never have I seen a person so flabbergasted, so stunned, so shaken. Her mouth fell open. Her legs seemed to buckle a little bit. Her friend grabbed her arm to steady her. As she was led to sit on one of the stools along the counter, we all sang happy birthday. And as we came to the end of our singing, happy birthday, dear Agnes, happy birthday to you, her eyes moistened. Then when the birthday cake with all the candles on it was carried out, she lost it. She openly cried. Harry gruffly mumbled, blow out the candles, Agnes. Come on, blow out the candles. If you don't blow out the candles, I'm going to have to blow out the candles for you. And after an endless few seconds, he did. Then he handed her a knife and he said, cut the cake, Agnes. Yo, Agnes, we all want some cake. But Agnes just looked down at the cake Without taking her eyes off of it, she slowly and softly said, Look, Harry, is it all right with you if, I mean, is it okay if I kind of, what I want to ask you is, is it okay if I keep the cake a little while? I mean, is it all right if we don't eat it right away? Harry shrugged and answered, well, sure, it's okay if you want to keep the cake. Keep the cake. Take it home if you want to. Can I? she asked. Then looking at me, she said, I live just down the street, a couple of doors. I, I just want to take the cake home, okay? I'll be right back, honest. And she got off the stool, and she picked up the cake. And carrying, like, carrying it like it was the holy grail, she walked slowly toward the door. As we all just stood there motionless, she left. When the door closed, there was a stunned silence in the place. Not knowing what else to do, I broke the silence by saying, what do you say we pray? Looking back on it now, it seems more than strange for a 
sociologist to be leading a prayer meeting with a bunch of prostitutes in a, in a diner in Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning. But in that moment, it just felt like the right thing to do. I prayed for Agnes. I prayed for her salvation. I prayed that her life would be changed and that God would be good to her. When I finished, Harry leaned over the counter and with a trace of hostility in his voice, he said, hey, you never told me you were a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to? In one of those moments where just the right words came, I answered, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for whores at 3.30 in the morning. Harry waited just a moment, and he almost sneered when he answered, No, you don't. There's no church like that. Because if there was, I'd join it. I'd join a church like that. Wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all like to join a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning? That's the kind of church Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God to earth, friends. A church full of all the wrong people. A church that meets people right where they are. A church of different cultures and languages. A church that realizes that God's kingdom, the last are first, the first are last. So none of us should take ourselves too seriously. That's church, my friends. May we live into it love into it, and break bread together with all of them this day and always. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able and join as we sing 776. Let us break bread together, number 776. As we share in communion today, on World Communion Sunday, we are going to begin with a litany 
that you can find in your bulletin. Today's table, as already mentioned, is covered with bread from around the world. Bread that reminds us that our expression of the faith is but one in a vibrant tapestry around the world. So as we read this litany together, I ask that those of you on this side of the church, we'll call you piano side, because this is where the piano is, will read the part that says piano. And those of you on this side of the church, the organ side, will read where it says organ. And then we will all read together the part that says all. So will you join me now in a communion litany? We gather around the table in places far and near. Eating sourdough, rye, tortillas, crackers, wafers, and wonder bread. The body of Christ. Drinking the wine or the juice from handmade chalices and silver goblets, golden spoons and many cups, the blood of Christ. The bread and cup unite us with all who would follow Jesus. This meal reaches back through the centuries. This table reaches around the world. Let us eat and drink with joy. Friends, we enter a holy space with communions around the world. And I remind you in these moments that this table around which we gather is for all Christians. It's not my table. It's not First Baptist table. It's the Lord's table. Here we offer Christ's love and forgiveness to all who seek it. And all who believe in Jesus as Lord are welcome here. I believe that when we approach our shared remembrance, we do so with a sense of awe and responsibility. Here, we not only remember Jesus' life and death and resurrection, we also remember our own complicity in how the world treated the Son of God. For we are all in need of God's grace. We have sinned, we have fallen short, and this is a space to be vulnerable, to remember that we are not perfect, and yet we are so loved. So looking in your bulletin, will you pray together with me in unison a prayer of confession, a time to admit where we have all fallen short and receive the grace of God anew. God, we yearn to be a worldwide community of believers, united in your spirit. Yet we are fraught with divisions, denominational, political, theological. We are weighed down by tensions and things that break us apart. Forgive us, God, when we fail to build a bigger table and instead erect walls to keep us apart. Help us to reach out across our differences and love this world as you love us. Amen. Even when our cups run dry, God's grace overflows. Even when our plates are empty, God's generosity overflows. Even when our hearts feel barren, God's love overflows. Friends, you have been called and claimed by the God of all things, and by the abundance of God's grace and the power of God's love, your sins are forgiven. Amen. In many different languages, by ordained clergy and by volunteer pastors and lay leaders, something like the words we will share today called the words of institution. When Jesus told us why we are to eat this meal, they're going to be heard all over the world. Today, we are also going to hear some of these words in other languages to remind us of God's universal love. If you know another language, you might pray a prayer in that language to remember our shared faith with so many others. So let us remember together today. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his friends around a meal. And Jesus took bread, bread that perhaps looked like this, perhaps didn't. And after he blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you.
dass ist mein Körper gebrochen für dich, teuer dies Erinnerung an mich. Primiert spasche weiter, se tiele moje, z nie vesje. Este pan es mi cuerpo, que por ustedes entrego, hagan esto en memoria de mí. Ceci est mon corps rompu pour vous. Faites cela en souvenir de moi. Jesus had unleavened bread baked for Passover. For us, it's a sourdough bread made by a church member. For others around the world, it's wafers or oat bread or naan or focaccia. And yet others in war-torn or famine-stricken places, the bread might be whatever they have available whether actual bread or not. So when we remember today, we hold our own version of this broken bread in our own culture, our own heritage, and we remember Christ's gift of salvation in our own language. And like the bread, the juice around the world will be different. For many, it will be wine. Some, like us, will have juice. Some will celebrate with water that had to be carried from a dirty well some miles away. Some will use individual cups. Others will share a fancy goblet. And still others have been passing around whatever cup was in the home where they were meeting. And still this cup, like the bread, represents something important. The blood of the new covenant Jesus came to give us in each place, in each community where it is shared, just as it does in ours. And we remember with them in that same way that after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Each time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Dieser Kirch ist dein neuer Bund in meinem Blut. Jedes Mal, wenn sie davon trinken, tun sie dies in Erinnerung an mich. Bože krov moja, nova zapivitu, što za balatova prolevajemsa na vid postenja grešiv. Esta copa es el nuevo pacto en mi sangre. Hagan esto cada vez que beban de ella en memoria de mí. Cette coupe es la nouvelle alliance en mon sang. Faites ceci en souvenir de moi. Now as we partake of communion, I ask that you will make your way up the center aisle to receive bread and cup and then return to your seats by the side aisles. If you cannot come up for mobility reasons, we will come to you and serve you at your seat. So come and take the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation.
take and eat. The cup of salvation, drink and remember. Will you join me in a prayer of thanksgiving? You can find this in your bulletin. We will read it together in unison. Great God of the whole earth, we are thankful for your abundant grace that washes over the whole of creation. We praise you that we can be one in spirit and truth with other believers in different places and cultures, speaking different languages and eating different foods. You are truly the God of all. Amen. I will offer a benediction in just a moment, but before I offer that, I offer you something else. If you would like to take home one of the many loaves of bread we have available today, I hope you will stop after worship. Our communion committee will be bagging them up, and we hope that you will take it for your use at home or to donate to someone in need. Hear now the benediction. You were called to this table. You were fed at this table. You were united at this table. Now you are sent from this table into all the world. Go therefore into the world with courage. Set a place for all who hunger. Fill the cup of all who thirst. And as you go, may the spirit of power and love attend to you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ uphold you. And may the great faithfulness of our God sustain you now and forever. Amen. Will you rise, stretch across the aisle, grab your neighbor's hand, and let us sing together, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Mm -hmm. 